was he's a long distance runner. One of these coaches said, hey, I'm going to put you on an asthma drug, which was clenbuterol, and I'm going to give you halo testing. So it was 80 mics of clen, and this guy's 150 pounds. He goes on a run, gets about five minutes in, and he's cramping so bad that he you know, can't walk. Dirt to stone. <laughs> I know. Like, uh, if you take that on your first day and you, know, you sit down on the toilet, you're like cramping. Vigorous Steve here with Vigorous Podcast. Today I'm joined by Jake Benson, who's the owner of Better Through Biology. And I heard that you're coaching like athletes in multiple different sports. You're a bodybuilding coach and a powerlifting coach and an MMA coach and an NFL coach. And you're basically helping all of these guys to optimize their <laughs> biology, obviously, <laughs> as your uh, yep. you know business implies. And Jake Feather was here in Thailand a couple a uh, couple weeks ago. And we were discussing a little bit about my YouTube channel. And he said, you got to get Jake Benson on. So here we are. Thanks so much for coming on. I saw two podcasts with you um, on Mark Bell Power Projects. But besides that, I don't know so much about you. So can you give me like a little bit of an introduction of yourself? And so, so my audience can get to know you also. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of different performance coaching. Uh, um, I, I went to school for chemistry. So uh, I did a lot in like biochem and whatnot. And then I kind of came on. Um, into i actually do a little bit with like think tanks too so i help uh okay. you know kind of design some drugs and whatnot um on the side but um, um but most of my work is is yeah performance coaching so i do a lot in powerlifting i do some in bodybuilding uh do some in the nfl do some in you know mma and kind of just call myself a performance coach um mm -hmm. and you know so I'll, I'll coach a lot of different sports i really just like you know a challenge and just to to help people and you know learn their biology and you know, do it the, the healthiest way possible. Right. I saw that Joe, Joe Sullivan is always very, uh, you know, complimentary of what you did for his um, career. And for the guys who don't know, Joe Sullivan was the guy who squatted and then the bar bended so much that he couldn't rack it. And I'm sure yeah. everybody's seen that video. Right? <laughs> if the bar ain't bending, you ain't pretending, <laughs> you're just pretending. So he is that guy for the guys who don't know who Joe Sullivan is. So so he was always very complimentary of what you did for his career, because it seems that you really extended his career by just, you know, incorporating certain things. So maybe maybe we can start there. Like, what did you change for Joe Sullivan? And what, what was kind of the main difference uh, going forward after you kind of connected together? Yeah, no, absolutely. So with with, with Joe, he fell into uh, a little bit of a vicious cycle and it, it does seem to happen. Some kind of, you know, like form of this cycle seems to happen in, in just about every sport I, I've seen. Um, but in this case, the, the general, like, you know, the equation of what happened is, Hey, I use this drug and I use this protocol and I got this result. So if I do more of it, then I should have more result. And, you know, you kind of get into this like vicious cycle. And so, you know, what happened with him is he ended up, you know, sustaining a, a pretty significant injury um with you know that bar bend and, and joe like for, for the people that don't know him he's like uh, in my opinion he's the best uh squatter on the planet like pound for mm -hmm. pound i don't think anybody is uh you know can match him at 220 pounds he's squatted 852 i think it's the current yeah. all-time world record just phenomenal um and, and that's like in sleeves and a belt it's raw it's crazy yeah. uh but with him what happened is you know he gets this injury he gets an inhibition uh in his uh what we might call like a thoracic impingement syndrome where mm. his pec and his tricep are no longer, you know, firing correctly. Right. Um, and I'll, there's, there's a lot of things that can, you know, cause this. And I, I don't want to get too wrapped up in his cause I want to be able to kind of apply this, uh, you know, mm. to, to everybody here. But what can happen is you use these drugs, whether it's AAS or whether it's, you know, maybe a, a little bit of like prescription stuff too. That's, you know, fairly common things like Adderall or stimulants. Um, mm. And whatever and you combine these together and, and you're creating quite a bit of oxidative stress on the brain um and when this happens in you know you're, you're pushing it your brain will eventually inhibit yourself from continuing this it's like hey if i keep going you know i'm, I'm going to start experiencing like cell death i'm going to start experiencing, experiencing whatever and so with joe a big part of what we had to do was uh kind of pull him back reduce the amount of oxidative stress on his brain and also kind of lay out new uh, pathways for him to basically be able to recycle eight. What I like to think about is like systemically recycle ATP in a little bit healthier of a way with lower oxidative mm -hmm. stress. So like, for right. example, for him, um, you know, and maybe we'll, maybe I'll keep this to the brain for a second, but like with the brain, uh, it obviously uses a lot of ATP, right? It's going to, there's a lot of hydrolyzation that's going to occur, but the brain, it can really only use glucose and can use creatine phosphates. Um, and so when you're looking at glucose, you can basically have like glucose, you know, 
with oxygen or without oxygen. And if you're, you know, a little bit out of, let's say you're a little bit out of shape and your oxidative phosphorylation skills are low and, you know, you don't have a ton of creatine storage and maybe you're like, you know, let's say like cardiac health is a little low and your hemodynamics kind of suck. And so you're not really even able to get to a point where you're recycling creatine in the first place because, you know, like SpO2 is just staying super low, heart rate stays super high, whatever. Now the quickest way to recycle ATP is going to be through this non-oxidative, or sorry, Oh yeah, sorry, non-oxidative phosphorylation, right? So it's going to create a whole bunch of like lactate, hydrogen ions, whatever, start creating a whole bunch of oxidative stress to the brain. And then you throw in things like, you know, Adderall, let's say like Adderall and Trend, which is pretty common in, <laughs> in every sport, the worst, right? It's probably the worst combination. It is dopaminergic cycling alone. And of course, the oxidative yeah. stress from the steroids is already tremendous. I mean, there's Very even high. scientific evidence that proves that, that training on steroids is probably the worst oxidative environment you can put yourself in. And then there's even more scientific evidence that says that you should avoid vitamin C post-workout because that blunts the hypertrophy response. So I think a lot of people got a little bit upset, you know, and, 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 and um, you know, conflicted on what to do post-workout. But I think antioxidant status in the body when you're enhanced and training insane is probably the most important thing we can focus on. Because when you look at other scientific evidence, you see that a lot of the organ damage, again, like you mentioned, the brain, is oxidative stress. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so please absolutely. continue. Like, what, 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 like, which route did you go down to to kind of mitigate these these terrible effects? Yeah. So, yeah, there's a couple, and like you said, like you know, we have a like if you want to take trend and like Adderall, for example, it's like cool. We have like a ton of extra glutamate, a ton of extra dopamine, and now we're gonna, you know, that's gonna flood a whole bunch of calcium ions into the cell, and we we'll get that. We start upregulating the amount of like phospholipases and whatever starts to break down the cell integrity. And now, you know, mitochondria can't function right. Uh, we get oxidative stress, cell dies, right? And so that's what we're trying to limit. And so there's two sides of the coin. And like you mentioned, it's like, well, a lot of people will say, okay, I have oxidative stress. That means I need to remove oxidative stress, right? And so like, oh, maybe like vitamin C or maybe I'll take like a curcumin or maybe I'll take like, there's a million things, reserve it all, like mm. uh, C3G, whatever, uh, you know, to, to remove the oxidative stress. And it's not always the case, right? It, and sometimes it is, but right after your workout, let's say, for example, like what you were saying, it's not the time to do it because, uh, and we can, I, I want to kind of come back to that in a second because then we can mm -hmm. really talk about like how growth occurs and, and where we can throw in cool things like growth hormone and other things besides like just pure AAS and whatnot. Um, so with Joe, it's like, cool. We have two sides of this because one, we need to reduce the amount of oxidative stress that's occurring in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we get... Uh, and, and, and for, for Joe specifically, we really wanted to focus on how do we get less non-oxidative, you know, glycolysis occurring? And then two, what can we do to, on the backside of this, reduce it and kind of teach, uh, the brain and, and, and kind of the liver too, because it's a hepatic process, right? Um, how to remove these free radicals but at the right time? Like, how can I handle more of this load so I can handle more training, uh, stress later? And so some of it became, uh, on the on the front side of that part one was hey we got to improve like you got to get got to get in shape right and so uh, a way to do this for him is we did a lot of what we called uh, VEGF work and it's basically you know we're improving the the vascular system um, mm -hmm. we we want to uh, you know make new blood vessels and improve the dilation of it um, and and what we want to do is have more oxygen available especially in the brain. Um, are we talking about, other, to, to, to interject, are we talking about, because I'm sure my audience is immediately thinking about uh, body protection compound 157, are we talking about this direction to increase angiogenesis and vascularity, or are we talking about increasing adenosine monophosphate concentrations in the bloodstream or other uh, vasodilators, like which which methods are we talking oh, about? Oh, yeah, to? that's a, we're purely going off a of training stimulus, right? So we were having okay. him do things in the gym that would... Uh, very, you know, specifically for him, cause hypoxia in the right areas uh, mm -hmm. to have a very specific VEGF response. So, like, for example, like, let's say, you know, for your legs or something, like, you go in, and you've all felt this before, like, if you've gone trained, like, on a salt bike or just done too many lunges or, you know, too many reps, you experience that, like, deep hypoxia, like, I cannot contract mm -hmm. through this anymore. Um, mm -hmm. That's where now the cells are actually going to start secreting a very specific growth factor called VEGF. When the mm -hmm. cell itself actually you know gets hypoxic it's like cool i'm going to start secreting this hormone or sorry this protein to signal to my brain that this damn like damage i guess you could call it this is what's occurring down here i don't know if you even want to necessarily call it damage because 
uh, you know, and if it goes too far, you start getting heat shock proteins, and that's when there's actually damage, and it's kind of a waste because you don't really make any kind of adaptations from heat shock proteins. But mm-hmm. for VGF itself, it's like, cool, let's have you get on a salt bike and do some, like, you know, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what we did. It's been a couple of years, but it, it could be something like, uh, you know, hold a wall sit and then get on a salt bike and just really, you know, developing oh, right. the so really, system. really the torture route. So it's, we're not touch, touching any drugs. We're mm-hmm. creating hypoxia internally within the muscle and then not taking any medications to offset that. Okay, there's so many medications like miltronate and hypoxin and amoxapine in Russia that actually offset. Amoxapine's that. awesome too. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thankfully, somebody also knows about this stuff. No, dude, no, I would love to come back to that because amoxapine is one of the coolest, I, in my opinion, one of the coolest like nootropic like drugs we, we really have, especially what it does I love with it. With uh, with vision and everything, yeah. um, so but, so first, you know, so you increase vascular uh, growth growth factor internally by creating hypoxia, and it's just through you know regular exercise. Training. Yeah, yeah, like believe it or not, we don't always need like a drug to do something, right? Like yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah. times, drugs are, are are just like mimicking what we can already do on our own, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not, sometimes it's like, oh, I need more blank. So insert drug here, or it's like, hey, my cortisol is right. too high. I'm going to take a whole crap ton of you know some kind of maybe some an ACTH block or something, or maybe I'm going to take a lot of ashwagandha or or, or something. Um, And it's like, uh, do we actually need that? Or do we really just need a lifestyle change? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. It's like, I think that's one of the worst parts with like people reading blood work sometimes is they're like, oh, wow, like this is too high or this is too low. What can I take to improve it? And it's like, well, it actually all kind of starts with behavior, right? It's like, let's take a look at your lifestyle first. What can we change? But not to, you know, get on too different of a topic. Um, and then with him, we also wanted to improve his beta, uh, his beta oxidation skills, especially in a parasympathetic state. So can we, uh, you know, you know, make this beta oxidation process happen without some kind of sympathetic ligand? Like, can we do it without like glutamates and epinephrines and, and whatnot? Um, and, and so we were really developing that. So we used a lot of pre-workout, uh, injectable carnitine for that, um, which, you know, it's, it is a great one. And then the other side of it too, is we really tried to improve his ability to recycle creatine. Um, mm-hmm. Because if we can use creatine phosphates as the primary source of uh, hydro, you know, to, to, to uh, phosphorylize these ATP, ADPs and AMPs and whatever, um, then we're not ever getting this oxidative stress from glucose. So that kind of becomes the buffer of that like quick, you know, ATP right. recycling instead of having, you know, while we're kind of waiting for the, the oxidative and, you know, stuff to kick in. So, uh, so by those two manners, we did that. So with the creatine work, what we did is actually had him do a lot of a lot of sessions where we would get his SPO two as high as we could, doing some either breathing drills or some kind of like you know just a little bit of like aerobic work to to begin. And then it was just a ton of creatine work where you know, and we would actually use creatine supplementation as well. And that's why you know it's starting to be looked at for like neuroprotective effects is because of this as well. Uh, but we'd be like, hey, take a med ball, toss it. And, 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 you know, plyometric work, um, stuff like that, where it's very explosive, relatively short rest time. Is We don't want it to be full of lactic, but we also don't want to rely on fatty acids to recycle our ATP. So we're going to basically push out as much creatine kindness as we can, and that's going to upregulate the amount of creatine phosphates that we can store, you know, in the brain. So that was the one side that we handled. And then the other side was actually using some kind of antioxidant. But again, you, you know, what you were saying not after training, after training. The only time I think it would make sense to use an antioxidant like after training is if you were like training something on a Tuesday and you're like, oh crap, I compete on Saturday and I got to be recovered. I kind of want to like hit a race on this training session. I want uh-huh. I want to forget yeah. it, right? Yeah, it's like, okay, something, now. Something important to do afterwards because usually some, some you know, from strenuous workouts, you get some oxidative stress and also brain fog. So if you mm-hmm. take some injectable glutathione post-workout, and you're, you're for, okay, so maybe the recovery will be a little bit less and the hypertrophy response will be less, but at least I have a productive rest of my day. Then I see some practical application for it. And again, I'm not against taking a little bit of vitamin C before and after the workout. Um, but of course, you know, if you want to take antioxidants, it might be better to take that away from training. And it really depends on how, what high of a level you train at because these little things are probably not super required for recreational lifters. And it might be better just to mitigate a little bit of oxidative stress. But for the guys who compete at the highest level, of course, every little thing adds an inner percent or two percent of performance. And at the end, during the meet, that could be the difference between world records and, and placing tenth. <laughs> yeah, you know? that's that's see, that's a really good point of what you bring up is um Joe is not the same as somebody that's just getting to their gym for the first time, right? Like mm. Joe can 
create so much damage so quickly because he's so strong right? He's yeah. recycling a lot more ATP than someone else or, you know, not just ATP, but think about like all the acetyl groups now with like acetylcholine, you know, they're going to be left behind. And, the, you know, there's, there's so many things and all like, you know, he's going to, because of this adaptation he's made with this pars reticulata inside the brain, which is your gabinergic center, essentially, uh, it, he's allowing himself to actually be able to receive more, uh, you know, like dopamine and nor, like norepi or whatever uh, mm-hmm. in his brain as well, because now, you know, he's made that adaptation in his brain where it's like, hey, you know, because if someone, if some normal person were to step into Joe's body before he was about to squat 850, it would feel like the craziest panic attack you've ever experienced. Yeah. But for him, because he's so it's skilled normal. at it and he's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like, wow, wow, this feels good, you know? It's, it's normal like, to it, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we are a true athlete, especially if you do meets like that, I mean, all the neurotransmitters are completely upregulated, but it takes years to really get into that state where you can tolerate that. But it's required to lift that much weight, you know, and still listen to the cues, right? Because, I mean, you still have to be present. It's not like you just go in and lift. You still need to listen to when you can lift, when you can rack, because otherwise you get a failed attempt. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so it's pretty fascinating because, it, you know, he can create this much damage, whether it's to his brain or, you know, below the neck. Uh you know, this is where a lot of these, you know, uh, recovery protocols really come in handy. Not saying you can't benefit it from it when there's extra stress on your life. Like maybe, you, you know, you, you didn't have a chance to sleep or you just had a couple of days where you're really stressed out or whatever. Or maybe, I don't know, you went and partied on the weekend or something. You know, you just have a little extra to recover from. It's like, this is where things like glutathione can be really helpful. So for him, we would actually have him take it first thing in the morning. And the reason we had him take it first thing in the morning is actually for the CYP system. Because in the morning is where you have these selenium... Uh, well, it's where all your selenoproteins proteins are created, like glutathione peroxidases and whatnot. So, you, but you have the selenium, uh, selenium, like homocysteine glutathione interaction. This is where, like, okay. CYP and you know via your thyroid are, are recreated, and, and we really want to have as much CYP, you know, enzymes as we can uh, available. Cause this is the thing. Talking that's, about the, the cytochrome P450 <laughs> enzymes, right? The CYP correct four, and and there's like a both even aromatized enzymes are CYP enzymes. So, just for the audience to understand, okay. Okay, so you do it specifically in the morning so you can basically absorb the glutathione better. And I, I remember yeah. on one of your podcasts and I saw one of your product that you reconstitute the glutathione in a mixture of taurine. Can you explain yeah. that a little bit while we're on the topic of glutathione? Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. Yeah, so first, uh, we, we do do the glutathione in the morning because this is kind of like our, our uh, we have different periods of the day and, and we you know these are kind of regulated mostly via thyroid and, and a couple of different things, but you have, it's kind of like having a baton in a track and field. And this kind of gets passed on throughout the mm-hmm. day at a certain times. So like, Oh, I see sunlight now, you know, uh, let's kick off Selena proteins. And this is where you're creating a lot of these kind of like natural antioxidants. So what we're trying to do is not necessarily do, cause this is a hepatic process, uh, as well. Cause that's, you know, it's creating all these proteins, meaning it's being created by your liver. Um, we don't want to do the job for it. So we don't want to just slam a whole bunch of glutathione and be like, cool, now job done, like go to sleep. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we're, we're trying to kind of just aid it. We're trying to supplement it. So more is not better. It's not like if you take a thousand mix of glutathione, it's better than taking 200. You know, it's like, <laughs> we're, we're not trying to just like eradicate everything. We're trying to just kind of basically help out the liver a little bit. Um, right. but what we're doing with the glutathione is we actually, uh, and I believe we're the only people that still do this as far as I know, and someone can correct me, but uh, we were the first to lifelize it, just kind of like the way that growth hormone is, is lifelized, is freeze-dried. And so mm-hmm. the second this glutathione is produced, we, we have a freeze-dried that's put into a, uh, a dark amber vial so light doesn't you know mess it up right. either. Um, and so that, that's the idea with it, though, is that now it gets shipped to you. Um, you're going to have a, a lot more available that's not being, you know, r- reduced along the way via heat, light, shaking it, whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we do use a, a backwater that does have taurine in it. And the taurine just kind of acts as a sulfur donor for the glutathione. So it just kind of makes it a little bit more potent for the same reason. We're trying to not let it get reduced. And even when it does get reduced, maybe inside you know, you're, once after you've injected it, we have this taurine acting as a sulfur do- donor to bring it back to life, basically, and have it, you know, be a little bit more potent. So you're just getting a little more uh, bang for your buck with, with right. the glutathione. Right, and, and taurine is reasonably inexpensive, so it probably doesn't add much more to the, you know, unless it's a patented formula, of course, you got to get, you know, your internal investment on the patent. Yeah, <laughs> they can be pricey. Right. Did you did you put uh, taurine in there also to help with regula- regulating osmotic pressure, like the intracellular and extracellular uh, water balance when glutathione is administered so it absorbs better? Is that one of the thought processes behind it as well? 
Yeah, because there's a lot of different like sulfur donors we could probably potentially use, but because of tarring, I'm sure everyone's used tarring for like their back pumps or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. you're exactly right. It just it's kind of <laughs> hits a couple birds with one stone. Um, makes you know just provides a better injection. It's probably one of the least painful injections I've ever done. Glutathione's pretty easy. Oh, okay. um, it's uh, just probably like I, I have my parents do glutathione. They don't mind it, and they don't even really train. Um, and it's is, really is that the a, taurine addition that it removes the pain? Because I have Bayer Tationel here at home, and I do intravenous glutathione once per week with my NAD Plus mm-hmm. and some other goodies um, that doesn't contain taurine. Uh, but that if I do that intramuscular at like 200 milligrams per two milliliters, it burns quite uh, badly, just like carnitine does. But I got used to the subcutaneous carnitine injections, but the intramuscular glutathione injections I still can't really tolerate. So I'd rather prefer to do it like once a week um upon waking or close to waking up um but then it's 1800 milligrams at a time yeah yeah no yeah we actually we do a couple things to the glutathione to make it a little bit easier of injection so we actually get it really finely uh um uh i can't think of the right word but so the powder is a little bit more Yes, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> what they do with Winstrol and all the other injectable suspensions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's actually, yeah. it's probably the easiest injection I've done. Um, okay. We do have our, our carnitine down pretty well too, so it, it doesn't sting as of like just a, a couple of weeks ago. We just came out with our new new formula too, so it's not so, uh, you know, just horrible to inject. It's, I have done some glutathione where it feels like battery acid injecting yeah. into, you know, wherever. And now this is this is a very very easy injection it absorbs really well uh tarin's definitely a part of it as far as why that mm-hmm. you know becomes such a such a, an easy injection but yeah it's not not too bad at all you should patent it because i i, I don't think i've ever seen the taurine addition anywhere and <laughs> right if you got something unique that increases the absorption and it removes the pain and maybe helps to disperse it right within mm-hmm. uh the cells right uh, acting as a pro drug delivery then, I mean, you, you might be on to something that none of the other pharmaceutical companies have because I've been using pharmaceutical like Bayer, Tationel, or other injectable glutathione products, and I have access to pharmaceutical carnitine here in Thailand, Ratio Farm, which is at, at like 1,000 milligrams for one milliliter. Insanely oh, high geez. dose, but it's, yeah, but it's reasonably painless because it's also micronized. Um, you know, it burns a little bit, but not as bad as some of the other products that I've used. So, so right. If you can be on par or even better than these pharmaceutical companies, then yeah, I mean, that's that's very promising. Because a lot of people bitch about these compounds and that they can't even tolerate the, um, you know, the post injection pain or or uh, because once you inject it, you can't walk away from it, right? And then they put it in the glute and you try to walk away from this horrible burning yeah. sensation, but it just follows you around. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I I remember the first time I did a glutathione injection, I was like, I was mad about it for like a couple hours because I injected <laughs> into my quad and I was like, I can't even, oh, no. I can't even oh. stretch out my quad anymore. It's so bad. No. Yeah, no, no, no. So, so luckily you're, do, you're doing it right regarding the formulations. So you would administer the glutathione in the morning and what mm-hmm. kind of dosage ranges are we talking about? Then it doesn't necessarily have to be for Joe, but are we talking about 200 milligrams, 600, 50, like what would be a, like an, a generic protocol for that? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a tough question to answer because you know if if someone came up to you and they're like, hey, uh, hey, Steve, what should I? How many carbs should I take post workout? And you're like, yeah, who so, are you? Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't know. Like, what do you need? <laughs> like, are you training hard? Are you a beginner? How much do you weigh? So you know, a lot of those factors come into play. Like, uh, like you know, uh, there are times where um, you, you know, I, like for me, I'm about 230 pounds. Um, and you know, uh, I, I'm not as strong as Joe, but I do squat almost 800 pounds. I deadlift 800. Wow. And, and, uh, and for me, when I have like my most stressed out time where I'm like, man, I'm just really need to slam some, uh, 600 is about the top end I'll do. Um, I, I don't really see a need for most people to go about that. There are cases, obviously like if you're 300 pounds and you know, you're just a massive bodybuilder or powerlifter or something, you can mm-hmm. probably go above that. But I, I like, it, it, you know. It just depends. Anywhere from like probably 100 megs to like 600 megs is probably the realm, just depending on what you're trying to do from it. Like if you're really yeah. sick, let's go higher end. If you're just kind of mm-hmm. getting over a little training, maybe stick to 200, you know? Yeah. No, the reason why I do it once a week IV is because, again, the, the intramuscular administrations I don't really like. Um, even though the Bayer Tattoo Nails pharmaceutical grade, it still gives me some discomfort. And since I do NAD plus intravenous once per week anyway, I figured why not combine everything? And it seems that 1800 milligrams is like the ideal dose for fertility parameters. 
Um, mm -hmm. So I do that once a week because I'm trying to get my wife pregnant. And my fertility parameters came back beautiful after being off cycle and off PEDs for, well, basically 11 months now. But at 40 years old, it just takes takes time to get your wife pregnant, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, if she was 20, it would go out. She would have been pregnant already, but we're both 40. So it takes a little bit longer. Uh, but that's basically part of my fertility protocol. And it helps with the skin. I'll tell you that. Absolutely. That much glutathione. My God. I mean, it helps a lot. So yeah, did, that was so, a little so HGK would probably do pretty good. Uh, what uh, GHK? You mean GHK copper? Yeah, GHK. Yeah, uh, with all the stuff copper does, you know, for the skin, whatever. It's just yeah. like gonna chelate the copper and whatnot. Right. But. Yeah, I still have a lot of that. I mean, it's uh, every time I talk about GHK copper, of course, people ask about hair loss and wrinkles and that kind of stuff. I stopped using it because I don't. My training intensity is not so high, and I found. I, I, I'm not sure if you notice this yourself. Like if you inject it intramuscularly, it can actually cause a little bit of collagen enhancement at that area and can cause side enhancement. Have you experienced yeah, this I, yourself? I, you know, I haven't messed around with doing that myself, but uh, I mean, it makes sense. Like with, again, you know, with everything that's going to do with like elastin and all that, um, mm -hmm. it, it seems to make sense. Uh, yeah, I, I believe that. I did it on my triceps you know. and I gained like, <laughs> quite a bit and it also helped with the connective tissue in that area so usually I, I would have a little bit of pain in the elbows following like crazy hypertrophy work when I was still training insane and then I would supplement with two to five milligrams uh, GHK copper intramuscularly post-workout maybe you know on, on the day that I train triceps and then I would do that once a week twice a week and and after a while the the size of the tricep got a lot bigger but the connective tissue also improved a lot and this is why I usually recommend GHK copper now and all uh, tendon recovery protocols alongside TB500, BBC157, collagen, Anivar, right? All the all the usual stuff. Because it, it seems to really help to thicken everything up and make it a lot stronger. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, it, I, could, I could see that. Yeah, I like that. That's a wonderful compound. Yeah, it's a wonderful compound. So with, regarding with the oxidative stress in the brain, like we got a little bit sidetracked there, but I, I tried to explain to my audience a long, long time ago that, you know, the worst thing for your brain is oxidative stress. And of course you can mitigate that with melatonin. And, and like you mentioned, you know, make your mitochondria and the ATP synthesis a little bit more favorable. So you produce less reactive, re reactive oxygen species. Can we continue a little bit more in that direction? Because I found it very, very interesting also as an entrepreneur, because brain health is, you know, very, very important when you run multiple businesses. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I can go, you know, and you're absolutely right. I think oxidative stress is the number one, you know, factor that, that we're looking at here. And there's a lot of ways that we can, you know, reduce this or mitigate it. Um, obviously, just like being active to some degree is going to be helpful because what we talked about, like if you're out of shape, you're going to rely a lot on these like non-oxidative pathways. And we're just going to pretty much just by like thinking too hard, <laughs> you know, it's like you can start <laughs> developing oxidative stress. You're just going to be more prone to it, you know. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to help uh, limit that. Because like, let's say you're on gear right now and you're, you know, prepping for a show or a meet or whatever. Um, and, and you're just going to have more, you're going to have a little bit more neurochem secretion. You're going to have, you know, just more oxidative stress in general. Um, and, and, you know, that should be something you think about when you're kind of ramping up, you, you know, your, your load too. So, and there's some things that you can do to, to, to limit that. And I, I always like to think of like, you know, what, what actually caused the oxidative stress. I think for the most part, uh, you can say like, you know, too much calcium, you know, via like too much glutamate or excessive, we'll just call it excessive, like sympathetic act, you know, activity. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there are some things that you can do when it's like time to shut it off. Cause I'm sure we've all been on like, you know, too much mass or trend or something. And it's like midnight and you're like, still can't sleep. <laughs> or like, yeah. you know, the second you get the tiniest sound or bit of light that comes in, all of a sudden it's like, Oh wow. I'm, I'm wide awake, you know, and, and whatnot. You go to and the so gym you, again. I'm already recording. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, what I would try to do is like, Hey, what, what can we do? That's going to like limit the potential for this neuron to fire in the first place. Right. Like how can I inhibit these calcium ion channels a little bit? Um, you know, without actually having to take like a calcium ion channel blocker, <laughs> you don't want to go right. down that route, especially if you're, you know, uh, there, but there are some things you can do and you can always start with like some meditation, some mindfulness, like that's going to go a long, long way. Like I'm sure like when you're, you know, in, it, you know, in that state where you can't fall asleep or you seem to, seem to can't relax, you know, it's like you take a breath, you're like, wow, how long have I been like flexing my abs? Like when was the last time I, bre I breathed too, right? Like, mm -hmm. breath. Um, and there are some like supplements you can take too, like 
I think one of the one of the really cool ones uh, that um, is starting to get a little bit more popular is uh, a, a new form of magnesium. Well, there's actually two I think are, are pretty beneficial. You have magnesium uh, three and eight, and then magnesium glycinate, and I think those are both pretty cool. Um, three and eight is just going to be a, a little bit more um, uh, special to the brain. It's going to be able to break that blood brain barrier and go into the brain. And magnesium itself is kind of like our anti calcium in a sense, uh, where it's going to you know inhibit. It's kind of you know a big part of that uh, GABAergic center. Um, so we can kind of inhibit a lot of that, you know, calcium. Um, and then two, uh, the magnesium glycinate is cool because then we have glycine and glycine, you know, does a lot with the uh, chloride anion channels, uh, right. ion channels, which is again, the opposite of, of calcium. We can use those along with some meditation, some breathing, maybe go get some moonlight, you know, and, uh, and, and do a little bit of something to bring a little metabolism to the pre, you know prefrontal cortex and away from the amygdala, uh, which can just be like some sensory feedback things too, like pay attention to how you feel, the sounds, the sights, you know, go through your senses or whatever. And we can really do a lot to like mitigate that stress as well. But I think one of the biggest things is like, hey, I'm I'm done with, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, running like multiple businesses. You kind of always have this like turned on, like like something's going to go wrong or something I'm forgetting or something, someone I haven't answered. You're kind of stressing and, and you kind of have to get to a point where it's like, okay, I'm done. I'm going to start shutting things off. Right. And, and and having that very specific, you know, like just hard line of I I am done. I'm going to start shutting things off, and, and and maybe even like journal some things. What you need to do the next day, we can do a lot just for brain health, just by doing those things. Um, then you have some other things like CBD. I think is probably one of the coolest ones too. You mentioned amoxapine, and I think amoxapine and NuPep can both be up there as well as far as things that are, are pretty pretty awesome for uh, either preventing or on the backside with the BDNF factors repairing the brain. Um, but, but yeah, there's a lot of cool things down. Yeah. So, so regarding like shutting it off at night, like I, I do it one hour before I go to bed, I shut everything off, no more work. I don't look at my phone, no social media. I go play with my cats. I had to kind of unwind <laughs> and about, I go to bed at four. So my circadian rhythm is kind of messed up, but I have to cater to the Western world because most of my clients are, you know, European based or American based. So I stay awake till 4am, which is like a very nice, um, you know, daylight time for you guys over there in the U S um, so my, my my rhythm is a little bit different than everybody else, but I, I got used to it. But I, I have a heart shut off at 3 a.m. in the morning, one hour before you go to bed. And then, like you said, you know, you cut off all the blue lights and you start looking into some supplementation that can help you fall asleep. Like, again, like you mentioned, magnesium 3 and 8, glycine, L-theanine can help. Uh, low-dose melatonin and, and, yeah, low-dose melatonin or 5-HTP and vitamin B6, B5P to help with conversion, you know, producing more melatonin later at night. So all these little things contribute. And I think, you know, if you can get yourself out of the uh, fight or flight state right, and, and reduce your sympathetic drive, then recovery is also significantly better. But the oxidative stress, like actually you allow your brain to recover at night. Because if you're constantly heightened and norepinephrine and adrenaline um, are, are just heightened all the time, then the oxidative stress is very hard to mitigate, get out of that state. And of course, you can use propanolol beta blockers to kind of, <laughs> you know, bring yeah, the levels yeah, yeah. down. But you know how much that does for performance? That's also debated. Like I, I really liked nabivolol back in the day um, to to kind of take the edge off because I was always wired, you know, just naturally. Uh, but now that I reduce my training volume and training intensity uh, to reduce the oxidative stress, I had to get my wife pregnant. <laughs> um, I, I realized that a lot of these things are no longer required. So it really depends on. Right, how you kind of design your life, um, how yeah. hard you work, how hard you train, how old, how how stress resilient you are. That you realize that a lot of these things, like the the invasive methods to get you out of that, aren't really required anymore. Let's move over to yeah. an, amoxapine because there's I don't think there's anybody else in the fitness industry who understands amoxapine and how it works. Like I've heard you just talk about it, and I brought it a little bit to the fitness community. It's it's being used as a nootropic, like the biohackers understand amoxapine so how how like what kind of practical applications of amoxapine have you found so far yeah no that's a really good question um and 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 actually the probably the best setting that i've found uh for amoxapine is actually with power lifters and specifically for squatting um mm -hmm. so and and the reason i do that is uh i think the the best way to to kind of visualize this is actually using the squat and a deadlift as an example because they're almost the opposite as far as the way that we recruit the motor patterns associated with them. Um, so to step back a little bit further, whenever you're using a very specific motor pattern, 
you have to be able to recruit this motor pattern. And the way that you recruit it comes so much from our visual cortex and then so much from what I would call everything kind of under the basal ganglia. And that's going to have to do with like efferent and afferent signaling. And between these two, we, we develop and we kind of acknowledge that, hey, this is what I am participating in, right? And so a lot of the times, like for example, with, with like, let's say you have a power lifter who's a, a good squatter and all of a sudden they have a mobility issue. It's very mm-hmm. unlikely, I've, I've found in my experience, that they actually have a mobility issue. It's more likely that they have a preparation issue and some inability to recognize that they're actually squatting. Um, and so with, uh, with squat, we rely more on the vision, on our vision, than we do with our deadlift. And then our deadlift, we rely a little bit more on efferent afferent signaling than our, than our vision. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, to recruit those. So with squatting, I've used uh, amoxapine because of what it does with our vision. It's actually going to help, you know, provide a lot of blood flow up into the visual cortex and enhance that. And it actually, I have found with people that struggle uh, with squat, usually tend to do really well with deadlifting. Um, you know, there, and you can get people are just naturally good at both. And, you know, I don't want to say like, if you get at squatting, you're going to suck at deadlifting or vice versa. Um, but amoxapine I found to be very helpful in recruiting this motor pattern. So like if you ever watch like the best squatters on the planet, like if you take like Joe Sullivan or like Hunter Henderson, she's just about to squat 700 as a female, which is absurd. <laughs> uh, they, they all kind of have the bad. same, <laughs> right? Yeah, me too. <laughs> right. Like I remember doing that. My, like, yeah. I remember <laughs> never <crazy>. doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean like, gosh, if I didn't get into powerlifting specifically, uh, there's no way. Cause I'm not, you know, it's not like I'm not big or anything, but anyway, yeah. um, they always have this gaze, right They're They have this gaze where they, they use their eyes to anchor on to something. And it's usually somewhere on the floor and they use that to kind of stabilize themselves to move through this plane mm-hmm. of motion. Now it's like, I understand where I am in this plane of motion now because the bar is suspended on our back. We don't get a lot from efferent afferent signaling. We can't really tell, you know, where, but with a deadlift, um, it's a closed circuit. And so we rely a little bit more on efferent afferent signaling and we, we utilize less focal vision, a little more peripheral vision. And so when they grab that bar and they feel the knurling and they kind of, you'll see a lot of people where they grab, grab, and they kind of pull, pull, like, you know, they kind of do that, like, a right, couple, once like, they're shot, pulls. they're ready, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's done get, get, uh, gathering this motor recruitment um through and you know via this like pars compacta especially um and, and trying to basically center themselves and realize okay this is deadlift this is where i am and fire right so kind of lining up the, all these motor uh motor units you know throughout your whole entire body and, and preparing them to fire at a very specific cadence and uh so i found amoxapine very helpful for you know squatting and, and more visual uh visual centered um practices so you know this has also been really helpful and things like it can be very helpful in things like fighting it can be very helpful in things like you know uh really anything that's going to rely on like the the bad application of that would be like marathon running right like we don't want enhanced like focal vision while you're you're, you're running long distances you're going to start kind of tightening up and start taking like you know a little bit faster strides and all of a sudden you're hypoxic for no reason um, right. But that that's one of the coolest applications I found for it. There are some other cool things as far as not in the gym setting. I found it to be very helpful when you're reading like long text that's kind of boring and it's just very straining on the eyes. Like I'm sure you've gone through research articles and you're like, dang, my eyes are like, you know, <laughs> they're on fire. <laughs> yeah. uh, and like amoxetine can be very helpful, you know, before to kind of to help that. Maybe it's uh, astaxanthin, you know, post for, for the, uh, uh, for the kind of, uh, antioxidants that are specific to the eyes. Um, right. Yeah, uh, I, I'm really. I was actually really surprised to hear you bring up amoxetine because I don't know that I've ever heard anyone else really. No, I think maybe like one or two other people. It's just, so I, I I used to coach a lot of drug tested athletes, so I was always on the forefront to make sure that they could still run something into the show that was not on the WADA prohibited list. And then amoxetine came up. Red Muldronate was already added, but hypoxin and amoxetine and Mexidol, those three. Mm-hmm. You could still use it, and it increases endurance, but also hand-eye coordination and focus. You can use it in, in a multitude of different sports, and many of these have very potent antioxidant properties, which don't really seem to overlap with you know negative effects, I would say. So amoxapine, for example, I always felt like it was a supercharged ubiquinol regarding cardiac function. So if you use it for long distance or, or you know long distance running or something where endurance is required, stamina is required, 
Then I always felt that it also increased uh, cardiac function, especially if you combine it with ubiquinol. And then, of course, you can you know combine it with again diazopropylene uh, dichloroacetate for mm -hmm. for ATP synthesis, and then you're basically unlimited. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, absolutely. That that's actually a really interesting. I, you know, I've never thought of amoxapine for like endurance uh, events because um, if you're using that for like kind of long long distance uh, cardiovascular things, but maybe in a non competitive setting, that's that's phenomenal. That's a really cool mm -hmm. application there. And hand eye coordination also like video gaming. That's it should be really big in video gaming like that and new pet are, are, are big ones. Um, yeah, then maybe yeah, you can phase the Adderall out. <laughs> Yeah, right. Like kind Maybe of video games, think, all these guys are like, and that's why they're so skinny because they're just on both loads of Adderall and Nupept. And Nupept, they also like, I don't even need videos. to eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I got my bang energy drink here, which is, you know, it's got enough calories. Um, yeah, but Amoxapine, like you said, it would I'd really help with gaming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I never thought about it like that. Uh, I, I've always felt like it, it's worked very well as a preventative oxidative stress, too, rather than just mm -hmm. like a pure antioxidant. Um, right. Which is why I think we don't seem to get those like negative uh, adaptation effects, right? Um, and and you know it, it does a lot to prevent that. Like if you ever take it and then do something versus you know taking it and, and or not taking it, doing the same thing, you'll probably notice a little bit less like the brain fog and whatnot right. after. So yeah. yeah, did you ever use cerebral lysine to mitigate the brain fog that athletes experience no. after meets? No, I haven't really used a lot of that. Do you have experience using that? Yes, yes, a lot. <laughs> So, so what I like, uh, cerebral lysine is used for, you know, a multitude of various clinical applications and it's very well documented and used in Russia and it's even FDA approved here in Thailand. They use it for anxiety and depression and all kinds of, uh, you know, personality disorders basically. But because it's such a potent uh, compound regarding brain drive neurotropic factor and the other um, growth factors or neurotropic factors which are in there, you can actually kind of reverse the brain fog and the neurological damage that you get from strenuous workouts. So I see a practical application following powerlifter meets or practical application after boxing or MMA events. And some of the athletes that I coached through these drug tested boxing or MMA events, they used five, 10, 20 milliliters cerebral in the, the week following this event. And they're sharp as hell again. Whereas normally yeah. if they get a knockout or, or even if they get a couple punches in the face that landed hard, you know, they're, they might be a little bit fuzzy <laughs> for a while. Well, I mean, it's a like a, yeah, it's like a micro concussion, right? But the, the, the brain derived neurotropic factor and the other neurotropic factors of cerebral and if you do pretty high dosages, it, it really resets everything. And I use it, you know, a month off and then a couple months on, you know, a month on and then a couple months off and then reintroduce it again. And I feel for entrepreneurship and also to, kind of get out of this, you know, if you're at the end of a training block and you really try to set PRs, it just, it doesn't affect you mentally. Whereas otherwise I would be just, you know, two hours, three hours post-workout when I had a phenomenal leg day or a back day, I would just sit there in front of the computer screen trying to get work done, but I couldn't get anything done. And like now you're good the, for staring at the floor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I can eat two meals and that's it. You know, I can do any client work when I was still coaching or let alone read scientific papers. But then the cerebral lysine would kind of snap you out of it within a couple of days of use. And then, yeah, you'd be highly productive. So I, I see, that's why I included it in my entrepreneur deep dive video series where, where I optimize neurotransmission and, and you know, improve uh, brain drive neurotropic factor in the brain with new pept and, you know, cerebral lysine. And a lot of people found that beneficial. So look into that. I think your athletes could benefit a lot of it, especially after meets, because it's, it's yeah, I like so that. much strain. <laughs> Yeah, it's so much. Yeah, strength. I have to take a look into it. Yeah, that that sounds awesome. Yeah, and it's it's a really cool compound, and it it also seems to help with like mood management and depression and stuff. And of course, a lot of us, which we usually don't talk about, but a lot of us come into these sports um, because we have some demons here and there. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, right? I had, I had a boatload of demons, and then you know, you go <laughs> you go to the gym five times a week to kind of you know, that's your therapy session. But the cerebral license took all of that away. It was great. So wow. now, yeah. now I don't have to go to the gym to be in this perpetual, like, you know, crazy state. So, so this is also one of the reasons why I was able to mentally reduce the training intensity because a lot of us go to the gym to kind of beat ourselves up to, to deal with, you know, trauma and then, you know, mental things and that you hold it all and you take it out in the gym. But I think I was able to overcome all of that with medications like cerebralizing. Yeah. 
The, yeah, the that's question phenomenal. is can you can you then bring the training intensity back when it's required? That's 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 the question. Yeah, yeah, that sounds like a lot easier than than dealing with the back, you know, backlash of it. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. And so so you've used amoxipine mostly for those applications. Do you do you think it has other potential benefits besides being a nootropic and help with, you know, eye uh, performance? Or that's that's about it that you've used it? You know, I have used it in a couple a couple other applications. Um, I don't feel confident enough to, uh, you know, speak too much on it yet because I'm kind of a, a little bit in an experimental phase with it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But like, long story short, I do think there has a pretty cool application uh, potentially with with telemasartan in the evening. I think they could actually go hand in hand pretty well that I'm kind of messing around with. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, again, I'll, maybe I'll bring that back up a little later when 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 I can, you know, kind of confirm you know my thoughts there. But I do think sure. there's a potential to kind of uh, aid, you know, some some uh, actually a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of like fat loss and working on hemodynamics um, mm -hmm. via this method. But you know, I think there's is a that, lot of cool things. Is that, that like speed. mediated through the peroxisome peripheralator activated uh, receptor? Gamma, yep. yeah, there's some overlap there. Okay, because I, I just did a cardarine deep dive, which will drop next week. Uh, where I reviewed oh, that's all a great one too. Yeah, I reviewed all the scientific literature because there's like 27 studies about cancer now <laughs> when it comes to cardarine. Yeah, um, and it, it's weird because there's 19 studies that show that cardarine can contribute to cancer formation and progression at higher dosages again in the animal models or they use human cancer cell lines, which are cancer, so it can accelerate its growth, obviously. And then there's also eight studies that inhibit cancer. Yeah, I know. There's always so going to, you know, it, it's pretty and, interesting. I, I, I want to see your, your your thoughts on that. Um, next week, because, Monday, you, Monday. <laughs> cool. I, I'm interested to see that because, you know, if, it always comes down to like these underlying principles of biology because if you take one drug and you – you know, give it to 10 different people in 10 different circuits or one person, actually the same person in 10 different circumstances, they can all react so differently, right? Like yeah. if you take Adderall and then sit on your phone for the next two hours versus like doing a meditation and then taking Adderall and doing something specific with it, that's a totally different, you know, totally different effect than, than just taking it and sitting on your phone, you know? So uh, it, it would be interesting to see, see all that. I, I'm going to come back and watch that on Monday. Yeah. But I, like, I'm going to be honest, I'm not very knowledgeable about cancer. So I reviewed the scientific evidence and kind of uh, grouped it and looked for the human equivalent dose, which you can calculate with calculators going from mouse, mice models and uh, rat models. Um, and it, the confusing part is, is that in human cancer cell lines are the, the exact same uh, kind. Cardarine can cause, but also inhibit cancer in a different study. And it seems that the cancer inhibiting dose is higher then the cancer inducing dose. So mm. first you have to get cancer and then you can inhibit it with the same compound. Yeah, it's very confusing, <laughs> but it will be a fun deep dive nonetheless to kind of look. So, so you talked about using cardarine like to help with uh, fatty acid beta oxidation, maybe in combination with carnitine to kind of sustain that process. And then maybe use something like amoxapine alongside of that or um, you know another compound, like uh, certainly not mildronate because that inhibits carnitine synthesis. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so how, yeah, how I know. Yeah, you, incorporate that. Yeah, there, no, there's a couple. There's a couple cool ways you could do that. Um, so you use like cardarine, or I, I think it's also known as like GW, like 50, yeah. mm -hmm. 15, 16 or whatever. Um, if you use that with like carnitine, let's say pre workout with, you know, like I don't know, something like eighty grams of carbs and whatever. So cool. And now we can kind of have this cool glycogen sparing effect, um, mm -hmm. and we can, you know, we can rely a little bit more on fatty acids and kind of pay off some, uh, the training debts acutely, maybe via like a intrashake too, which is kind of cool. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, you know, I, I, like, yeah, I think there, there's some application for, uh, for some stuff in the evening as well, kind of, kind of following that same thing. Um, like I, I do think like amoxapine and maybe a low dose telemosartan in the right cases can be pretty helpful um, to kind of work on these, these PBO skills at night too. Cause I think one of, and again, like you're, you're a lot further into bodybuilding than I am. So I don't want to step on, uh, you know, toes where somewhere I'm not familiar. That's all right. We'll figure it out together. <laughs> but I, I think one of the things that, that can happen from, from what I've seen anyway, is that we rely, a lot of coaches are relying a lot on these sympathetic based ways to induce fat loss. Yeah, right. And, and so it drives like, me fucking nuts. 
Yeah, it's like, man, like if you're going to push – and then they wonder why they can't peak them right at a meet too. It's like – or a show. Yeah, and, and the vascular like, well, restriction is they're, 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 you know, it's this yeah, big. Yeah, you're leaving a – this yeah, big at the end of the small <laughs> window. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's like, man, it's like if I want to lose more fat, uh, like, oh, my client's not, you know, lean enough. I'm just going to do more clen or more thyroid or more cardio or like here now take, you know, like trend to get leaner or something. It's like, man, why are we not thinking of any of, you know, like yeah. glycogen sparing ways or anything? Because you're burning half your tissue off just by not considering these other ways. Right. And, uh, and that obviously has a cause cause you're going to get like rate limited lipolysis via these sympathetic means. Um, like you can only, you know, do so much. And then you obviously the gonna have those... of your performance because your heart rate goes so high that, that yeah. it, it, it's very, very hard to perform at peak performance because again, heart rate and, and your heart takes so much oxygen and, and fatty acids and, and glucose away from your skeletal muscle. And this is why I like, to maybe even use a beta blocker at certain periods of time because it keeps the heart rate low. And when it is required to uh, perform at peak performance, then your heart doesn't feel so strained, right? You might take the beta blocker out by that time and then reintroduce caffeine, which you might abstain from during certain periods of time. Like it has a very good performance enhancing uh, benefit regarding endurance and stamina and overall strength and, and central nervous system uh, drive if you abstain from it for longer periods of time and maybe use a beta blocker during certain periods of time to kind of bring the sympathetic nervous system down even more, then you respond very, very well. And again, fat loss, the problem with that is if you use all these stimulants, um, you know, the vasoconstriction and the strain on the heart and the impairment of recovery, it, it in the long run, it's just not good. So I've always looked into alternative fat burners like carnarine, carnitine, um, 5 amino one mq which is just new on the market to inhibit uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide recycling or a breakdown in adipose tissue. So fat loss is basically continuous. Um, so those are very promising, even though there's not some scientific evidence on it, but it does look very promising in my opinion. And, and you know, there's so many alternatives out there we can explore, like even glucagon injections or, or GIP, right? Gastric inhibitory polypeptide helps with um, adipose tissue uh, fatty acid shuttling, whether that's in or out. So if you're in a caloric deficit and you do use a little bit of a, a glucagon or, or you know, hormone sensitive lipase with uh, growth mm -hmm. hormone administrations, then fat just- That's a solid it, one. It falls out of the adipose tissue. And then you just needed to give it a place to go in the form of activity in a caloric deficit. Yeah, and I mean, no it really all does, required. Yeah, that's what all it really comes down to in the end too is hormone sensitive lipase. It's like, how am I getting this guy going? Right. Yeah. It's like, uh, by what means do we accomplish this? Um, and I think that's awesome coming up with, with different ways, but it, it seems mind boggling because, it, it, you know, you, it's like you only have so many cards to play. You're almost like playing a game when it comes to like fat loss, right? Where it's like, yeah. mm -hmm. you only have so many cards to play. You can play so many, let's say via like training, so many via like, uh, you know, supplementation and then so much via like a calorie restriction. It's like, right. in, what I think is a big problem is we see p people playing all their cards and there's no more cards to play and you're six weeks out, you know? And it's like, <laughs> man, like we didn't think that one through yeah, at all. There's still 8% body fat and they played all the cards already and they have the Joker card left that's DNP and they wonder why they show up watery. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> yeah, yeah. And, they, and that's the thing too is they show up and they're like, wow, they kind of look skinny fat and I, uh, let's just give them yeah. further. Like, yeah. right, that'll do it. Like, okay, yeah. you know, that's yeah. really well thought out. Um, but it, you know, that's exactly right though. Like you kind of, in my opinion, anyway, it seems like you kind of want to be able to pick up, be able to pick up these cards and be able to replay them too. Like what you're saying with like, well, maybe potentially using a beta blocker and then you come back and then you, you're kind of picking up the cards so you can replay like. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Increase sensitivity, right? Because you can only use a drug for so long and, and, you know, mm -hmm. and again, you, you go through various phases of training blocks and all the other performance enhancing drugs also contribute, right? I mean, once you start going from testosterone and boldenone to testosterone and anivar, and it has completely different effects on the glucocorticoid receptors. And, and especially if you add in the trend or Winstrol, which, which, you know, might inhibit the progesterone receptors, you are basically changing your metabol metabolism and how you respond to foods and other drugs, right? It all interconnects, but it's, of course, you need basically a, a degree in chemistry and biology for you to understand that. So there's not so many guys we can talk to <laughs> who, yeah. who the interplay yeah, but, actually but, works. 
Right. And what you're talking about is like, hey, now I have a novel situation that I have not accustomed myself to, right? And 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 now that's 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 like put picking up cards and playing new ones. But if all you know, the only cards you know how to play are clan, more stairmaster, more thyroid, and less food, it's like you're gonna kinda end up with the same result time after time. You yeah, know? skinny. Skinny with, yeah. with fat on the lower abs and lower back because it's stubborn body fat. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And it's, that's where you can always see the, the guys that have pushed too hard on it because they have that that lower, you know, like kind of abdomen Flabby. fat. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, every once in a while, it just like disappears. And you're like, huh, that's interesting. You know, it's like it's that rate limited lipolysis too. And probably couldn't just, get certain, probably couldn't get certain drugs and took a wake off. But, yeah, you know, exactly. Probably had to remove <laughs> drugs and took a week off from the gym because he was upset that he couldn't get the drugs and he looked better for it. I know. Yeah, for real. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's great though. It's, uh, you know, that's not exactly my world. I do do some, you know, things inside bodybuilding, but uh, I, I'm not very familiar with everyone's protocols. just something I've seen over and over again where it's just like, cool, more cardio, more clean. <laughs> it's all over the place. But luckily, like, you know, with these new kinds of drugs that, that a little bit focus a little bit more on the biology regarding fat metabolism, right? whether that's coming uh, from the adipose tissue and then being transported and then ending up in the mitochondria. Like if you understand this pathway, then fat loss is actually quite easy. Right? It's and an then, easy equation. Oh, yeah. And then if you have to deploy the clean when you're 6% body fat, so be it. Right. But you don't have to deploy it before you're 6% body fat. Uh, this is where a lot of guys go wrong, right? They, they're fifteen percent body fat, and they go on eighty micrograms of clean NT three, like you mentioned, and they wonder why they can't get below ten percent because you're burning. Yeah, up, you know, yeah, it's, it's as far as you're going. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. And then you need a diet reset to ride back up at fifteen percent. That's exactly right. It's like insane. weird. I have the same body for like the same five last five years. Yeah, I yeah. I don't know what happened. I used I tried all the drugs that Steve talked about, but it didn't work. So well, you, I tried them all at once. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> terrible. So, so uh, are you looking to upregulating mitochondri mitochondrial functioning with you know improving ATP synthesis within the mitochondria? Maybe using SS three one or MOT C, which of course is a mitochondrial signaling protein. Like, are you looking in any of those uh, pathways? Um, I mean, it always depends on what we're trying to do. Are you uh, regarding like fat loss in? in no, just over, like about? overall performance. Like, of course, mitochondria provides basically to break it down, uh, pregnenolone, right? The basic hormone and ATP, right? Those two are very, very important for well-being, um, you know, uh, neural trans, neural steroid synthesis and overall performance. So, so, you know, basically this is the direction we can go into because I noticed that improving my mitochondrial function by, you know, improving uh, reactive uh, antioxidant status, but also helping with, you know, particular nutrients that the mitochondria like and peptides that besides cognition that has improved, that performance has also improved. So are you, are you looking into any of these things with your athletes or for yourself? Oh, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. There, and there's so many ways to, there's so many ways to, uh, to do that. Like with, you know, with the tools that you're mentioning, there's a pretty good effect even just from like using things like carnitine and, and there's so many different, like very hyper-specific, uh, antioxidants that are starting to come out now too, like the C3Gs. And I think they're coming out with like yeah. a P3G, uh, can't remember the actual name of it, but those like flavonoids and all those things that are, that are going to be really popular as well. There's going right. to be a lot of cool ways to take advantage of those. But I mean, that's always kind of the goal, right? With almost any sport is like, how can I improve ATP recycling? It's like, how can I, like, you know, like if I'm going to be stronger, I have to have more available ATP and not only just more availability of it, but I have to be able to actually hydrolyze it and use it and actually convince my brain to use it all at once too. Cause like, you know, in powerlifting, it's like how much it's really comes down to like how much electricity can I accept in this neuromuscular junction and how much ATP am I allowed to hydrolyze at once? Right. And that's really like how strong you are. I mean, taking out, out of the fact like the actual mass and, and whatnot. Right. But um, but as far as like how much can I contract in this given moment, that's like the thing you're trying to peak, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you're a sprinter, it's the same thing. It's like how much ATP can I recycle without being inhibited? And same thing with like fighting or or in these combat sports, you know, especially when they go into like with like uh, jujitsu. Sometimes you have 20 minute rounds, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like 20 minutes. How can I make sure that I am not going to burn out in that time? So I have to have like a crazy ability to like either manage lactate or make sure I'm not getting on, you know, uh, non oxidative in the first place mm -hmm. or what, you know, building up these oxidative species in the first place. And then you can have these inhibitory factors that come up. Can I 
built up enough norepi and choline to overcome this and, and whatever i mean it all comes down to like mitochondria function right um and it's just like take in my opinion it all kind of comes down to like here's my athlete here's where they need to be um and you're kind of just like guiding a horse to water in a sense right where it's like right. mm -hmm. uh here's where i am this is where i need to be to be able to to get there and i'm going to work it back and then you can start talking about like i always like to start that with just like training stimulus first right it's like mm -hmm. hey this is the training i need to do this is then i'm gonna this is how i'm gonna fuel it and then based on the athlete here are maybe some supplements or little drugs that will kind of aid this person based on their limiting factors or their specific sport um and then with a lot of things i think you can and there's a don't get me wrong there's a ton of cool drugs out there that you know and there's going to be a ton that come out over the, especially like the next five or ten years like um that was just probably going to flood the market we're gonna have to figure out how to use them and, and see what they're I mean, I'm like, actually well, like, i was i was on the lookout on the clinical trials see what's going on i mean all those new myosatin inhibitors and the active oh, yeah. inhibitors oh man it's going to be game they're changers on. once though once those drop yeah I, no absolutely like the myostat inhibitors are always fun ones to look at because if you ever nail that down who, you know who knows but, but yeah you, you know you come back and you say okay how how do i how do i utilize these things and that's actually like a, a big part of where better through biology came from originally was i was working with professional athletes and it's like well we can't use anabolic it's like as much pe as much as people love to think that everyone in the nfl is on steroids it's very difficult to, it's very difficult to uh to be on steroids you're not going to pass those tests like you'd somehow no. have to never be tested and we have guys that get tested six or seven times a month sometimes it's you know yeah it's impossible it's like, okay. the, detection, the detection times are too long and he, i mean you could do sublingual exogenous testosterone but even that's detectable you know within within a couple of days of you know use it, it's not worth it yeah no it's not worth it right so you have to look into the, all these alternative compounds that you know are not on the wider prohibited list or that you know that they can't test for right exactly so, and, and and plus a lot of people think that like all these mma guys and nfl guys need steroids but in, if anything it just hinders performance because your the your your oxygen requirement it just yeah, goes up too high so a lot of these guys they gas out especially the mma guys i took halo oh, testing yeah. before the fight for three days and i gassed out i said well i, I told you not to do it well, you're nice and aggressive but your oxygen demand and your 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 whole system is not adapted to it. If you want to run Halo, you need to do it for six months so you can get used to it. You know, of course, your liver would not. Yeah, imagine. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> imagine like running Halo, though, or like Tren or anything. So these things that are going to make you contract really, really hard, um, almost uncontrollably. It's like, cool, I'm sending a signal to my brain that I want to contract as hard as possible with almost every movement, which if you've ever done Halo, I'm sure you felt that where you're like yeah. standing up out off your couch or off the chair and you're like a Dr. Magnus is like cramping on you. It's like, oh, we're going. And you're like, yeah, no. And imagine being in a fight though, where every little side step you're making, you're kind of hopping on your feet. All of a sudden your feet and your calves are hypoxic. You're like, wow, I'm cramping. Like one yeah. of the worst protocols I've ever seen was, and I, I just saw this on a consultation call just the other day, was he was uh, a long distance runner. And, hit, and one of these coaches said, hey, I'm going to put you on, a, an, uh, on an asthma drug and so which was clenbuterol oh. and i'm going to give you clenbuterol and i'm going to give you halo testin i think it was halo testin and and just got on around let's see what happens so it was 80 mics of clan and this guy's 150 pounds 150 pounds 80 mics of clan takes 20 migs of halo testin goes on a run gets about five minutes in and he's cramping so yeah. bad and you know can't walk Turned i'm like no stone. kidding <laughs> yeah I'm like who who was this that recognized like if you want to take 100 microgram if you want to take 100 micrograms salbutamol, like as an inhaler to open up your bronchial so you can, up, you know, breathe more and then use one of those nose, nose tapes to kind of open That's up your awesome. nose. That's awesome. I get it, right? But 80 micrograms, Clint? What the fuck? I know. Like, uh, if you take that on your first day and, you know, you sit down on the toilet, you're like cramping, you know? It's yeah. Like, and your heart rate is sky like, high, you know? Even if you're an athlete, your heart rate is just... Continues That's exactly it too. It's like you can you can have the craziest training capacity in the world, but if you can't manage your heart rate, you don't have an ability to even access that or showcase it. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. And I think that's the most important thing for like true athletes, whether that's NFL, MMA, or long distance or, or track and field, heart rate and mitochondrial function, I found the most beneficial um, just to increase performance and endurance. And I worked with a couple athletes like that who then contacted me like three months after giving them the protocol and said, yeah, I'm beating all these guys that are 10 years younger. I said, well, they're still drinking in the weekend 
and they're not doing anything to you know improve their cardiac function and their <laughs> mitochondrial function so it's that's that's pretty cool to see i mean you can take the human body pretty far and you don't even need steroids to get it done you know yeah and, and f- yeah i love what you said about that too like steroids and a lot of these like uh um like field sports or uh, you know whatever whatever you want to call them uh they're mostly going to be inhibiting because it does require so much oxygen and, and you're just going to mm-hmm. put them in, you know, you're going to put them in a bad spot. Like even if you had the enzymatic capacity to deal with all the lactate or the pyruvate or whatever, uh, like first think of all that, like stress you're putting on your liver just by how much, you know, like fatty acids and glucose and all these proteins that you now have to follow the change and, and whatever, and all that lactate that's coming through there and everything like that's so much hepatic stress. It's crazy. And then too, like, I, I can't imagine a situation where you can manage, you know, that much for that long. It's it, and you're contracting too hard. There's too much spinal shit going on. It, it's not going to be. It's not no, going to be that fun. Finishing if you if you finish, you have shin splints, lower back pumps, and and your kidneys and liver dealing with all the metabolic waste products. You know, you're beyond the floor for a week. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Just like, recovering, we, recovering from all of that. So when we talk about like uh, lactic acid or lactate um, removal, we're talking about uh, carnosine, beta alanine, citrulline malate, those kinds of things. Or are we talking about something like uh, D, what the DADA, diisopropylamine dichloroacetate? I keep forgetting what the full name is. Yeah, no, it's a tr- it's a mouthful for sure. Yeah, um, no, that that's a really good question. Um, there, there's a couple like beta alanines, obviously, you know, going to be a great one. There's some there's some really cool things with that. Um, with with data, well, I'll just call it data for short, so I don't mess that up a million times. Uh, it, it, kind of going back to what we originally talked about when you're talking about like, hey, we're we're going to metabolize glucose, um, but one we can do it with oxygen, or two we can you know do it without it. Uh, one of the cool things that data does is it's going to in, in, inhibit uh, to some degree, at least this, um, doing it w- without, uh, without oxygen. And, and so what that's really going to do is you don't really build up that lactate. And so when, you know, like track runners love it, that's probably one of the, one of the coolest applications I've had is like, with like 400, 800 meters sprinters where they're going, you know, pretty far. And if you ever ran like a 400 meter, which I actually ran in college, I, I was a, a track guy in the 400 meter. Okay. You're, you, you know, you're going to like, it's not if it's just like, when and how bad you're going to be at the end you feel like you're running through tar you know because there's just so much lactate build up that yeah. you're like trying to contract through it and you're like ah it's like you're running underwater almost it's so bad and you're just like i'm yeah. just trying to get to the end at this point <laughs> um that's going to inhibit that uh and, and and kind of change the way that the atp is being recycled in the first place which so is, that, that, is phenomenal so, so I've, I've never used data myself but i talked to athletes who've used it and they literally said again unlimited energy like the amoxapine combination with ubiquino um so are you able to mitigate the production of lac- lactate to the point you don't get these impaired muscular contractions anymore <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's a that's a good question, too. And that all depends on like dosage, because if you just take like 10 migs, you're not going to get rid of all like, oh, you know, yeah. all the lactate that you have. And you also, I don't think, <laughs> really want to like take so much data that you don't have any of it, too. Like you want to yeah. be aware, you know, and whatever. You don't want to change those dynamics too much. But yeah, it does reduce it quite a bit. Um, I've, I've used it before. Joe and I actually did uh tom platz's squat challenge it's almost it's been probably almost two years since we did that so we took on the five the 500 pounds for 23 reps yeah 520 yeah 525 for 23 and so my last training session um Uh before we took that on was probably i think it's like 11 days out and i took 507 and i took it for 20 and i used a little bit of uh data before and it was Mm. it was phenomenal yeah it it did a really good job and then um Uh yeah it was it was it was really cool uh, but yeah, it's 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 really a pretty phenomenal thing to use, especially you know in, in those kind of sports. Like it's, I would never like with something like MMA or or football. Data can be really really helpful. Um, you know, there's applications for it in, in powerlifting, especially when you're just trying to get like as much um, ATP you know recycled as you possibly can and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's 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 pretty phenomenal. If you ever want to try some, I'll, I'll ship some out to you. If you can, I don't know if Thailand's rules are really. Like oh, really don't worry about that. I know a guy. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> I've been yeah, here 20 years. Out, I, I, I know a guy. <laughs> you're, you're probably pretty connected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you should give it a shot. Like, you know, especially before training, it, it's, it's pretty fun to use. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm looking into it to try it after my wife is pregnant because I have to run everything through the fertility uh, tests, right? And there's no clear scientific evidence uh, regarding data and fertility. I mean, there's a lot about liver health and in mm-hmm. uh, certain viral infections, but regarding fertility, there's nothing. So I'm I'm abstaining. I wouldn't risk it either. Is pregnant. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I, and, I, and my fertility parameters right now are absolutely stellar, uh, but just still waiting for the good news. But yeah, I, I don't mind stocking up in a preparation for good news. <laughs> we'll yeah, talk yeah off definitely. We'll, we'll talk <laughs> off air. <laughs> so so you've, you've used it and recommended it quite extensively uh, from my understanding. And, and obviously it's something that you need to slowly build up over time. Uh, to kind of see what your tolerance is and, of course, what kind of practical applications, because this seems to be more beneficial for something that's long journeys uh, compared to, like, immediate strength. Like, I see more practical applications for strongmen who do, like, farmer's walks and all kinds of crazy meats Absolutely. and things than, than powerlifting. But even in powerlifting, I mean, if you do three lifts in a day, of course, it would be beneficial. And for bodybuilding, I would see for some practical applications for weaker body parts who um, Absolutely. need a little bit of the high metabolic and, and you know, fatigue and, and, of course, higher rep ranges is to kind of stimulate different, uh, you know, muscle type, uh, muscle fiber types. Um, so there's what I see it. But, of course, doing it for every workout, I don't think that's beneficial. I, I would rather do injectable ATP for a little bit of vasodilation instead. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I think you have the right idea. I think we have similar, you know, viewpoints on that. Strongman's really awesome application. Um, you know, I, I really actually like the way that you're suggesting it for, you know, your application of bodybuilding as well. Because um, sometimes you just have somebody that's like, they're so underdeveloped, maybe in like, I don't know, you'll, you'll see it, some men get this quite a bit where they do the tiniest bit of like PBO work and then their upper body just disappears. Like their pec delts and upper body are gone. Um, you know, especially when they have like a crazy aerobic capacity, like if they were track guys in the past or whatever. They're like, wow, you can build your legs, but you can't build your upper body. You know, it's like a little data. It's like, it, it, and they get to a point where it's like they do two sets. They're like, wow, my pecs are fried or my triceps are fried. You know, it's like, I, you know, it's like almost not enough training stimulus to really, it, it just gets really slow moving because of it. Um, right, so right. You, and then the other body parts just keep progressing while the the body parts that you're trying to improve just stagnates because the ATP isn't there, right? And then right. like for leg, like for legs, for example, if that's a weaker body part, which is, is it is for me, and I, I was never able to build up the stamina with, like, I mean, I know a lot about performance enhancing drugs and practices. I tried literally everything and I was still not able to build it up. Um, and now that I'm 40, it's probably going to be more difficult, but I would see some practical application for data because I, I do daily cardio at 30 minutes on the elliptical for heart health, cardiovascular health, and overall endurance. And it does increase my VO2 max and allows me to train in higher rep ranges for legs, which I do find is beneficial. But I think data would probably take that to the next level, allowing me to train at even higher rep ranges um, without having this limited capacity on my ATP senses digging into skeletal muscle for further ATP production, right? Because eventually you start burning skeletal muscle tissue. And I think that's one of the reasons why they're a little bit stubborn to grow. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, you know, on the post side of that, like, you know, even actually like getting getting into that a little bit, if, you know, you take a little bit of data, now you can actually get those, you know, the, those cells to secrete um, a little bit more, you know, specific proteins to whatever. It's like, hey, I created a little bit more damage uh, I, you know, and now like you go take your post-workout, like, you know, insulin or growth hormone or whatever, and now you're giving it something to do because, you know, like if you can't train hard enough, uh, to induce any kind of growth factors in the first place or barely anything, right. you know, your immune system just kind of comes through and it's like, okay, like we'll yeah. clean this up. <laughs> right. It's like, you can go to bed now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, whatever. It's not enough to be yeah. concerned. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can get to a point where it's like, cool. Now, like. And I'll throw, I'll maybe bump up a little bit of growth hormone post training or insulin or whatever, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm going to slam a bunch of, you know, carbs or whatever. And now they actually, there's a reason to have glucose synthesis, you know, synthase and whatever. We can actually produce glycogen and whatnot. And, and that's a way to do it without having to rely on like a, a ton of caffeine or, or a ton of some kind of stimulant just to get yourself to like train harder, you know, cause then, you, you know, let's say you use like caffeine cause you're like, I'm going to come in and just train hard and whatever. And your heart rate is so high on the end still that you go eat and you don't even have the capacity to store glucose synthase. Like you're not really storing yeah. new glycogen in your heart rates in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You're like, cool. Now I have a big old left ventricle. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the doctor said, sir, um, LVH. 
Yeah, you're gonna have to <laughs> take. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's terrible. So, do do you have an experience with injectable ATP? I do because that yeah. is is not very well used, but injectable ATP is is something I really enjoy, and it's been around for well, a very long time. I think Synthetech was one of the first ones. Sorry, the bodybuilding community used that as a vasodilator, the ATP or AMP, because ATP mm -hmm. converts into AMP, which acts as a very potent vasodilator if it ends up in the bloodstream, which is good for, for real, yeah. uh, muscle fullness, right? Because all the nutrients kind of flow around um, in common. Yeah, it kind of acts like but, that exercise yeah. mimetech. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so I I've used injectable ATP quite extensively because uh, that's what I had access to. Like I was never able to source data uh, until we talked. <laughs> so I've used it quite a lot, and I did notice that it improved, you know, certain body parts because the ATP um, availability is just so much higher. Even though the scientific evidence mm -hmm. is a little bit thin regarding if ATP can actually permeate into the cells, some scientific evidence says it can't, and then otherwise uh, others says it can. Um, but I always noticed that it improved my overall, um, basically like a super creatine monohydrate, right? Which increases ATP synthesis also. Um, so mm -hmm. I found that very beneficial. What, what, like, do you use injectable ATP and what, what do you feel is the best context to use that in? Oh yeah, no, I'm a really big fan of ATP. There's a, uh, there's a lot of like, you know, we use it a lot in powerlifting, especially like, you know, before, before big lifts, um, or when, when people are competing, there's a lot of applications for ATP. We used it for, you know, professional athletes and, and, and the biggest sports, it, you know, uh, it, and it's just shown some incredible, incredible results. Um, I, I'm a really big fan. I think it can be a little bit scary to use a lot of it. So I'd be very careful mm -hmm. with, you know, because all of a sudden you're like, cool, my heart's just beating like crazy, you know, and, and, and whatever. Yeah, it's, it's very like, potent. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very, <laughs> for, the, for the guys that ever did an MRI, uh, where they administer uh, adenosine monophosphate intravenously right, before they add in the gadolinium so they have the contrast because you need to hyperventilate like all the blood vessels need to expand for the MRI to kind of see what's going on regarding blood flow of the heart it's um it's one hell of a ride it's it, the vascular con you just start hyperventilating and heaving like there's and it, it it's gone in two minutes but it's crazy so this is the one of the risks of overdoing the ATP or accidentally nicking a vein where you inject that inter, uh, intravenously, uh, because yeah, I mean it, it it readily converts into AMP and it dilates your blood vessels and you're just laying on the floor hyperventilating. It's it's insane. So we're talking about you know maybe 10, 20, up to forty milligrams. I think it's reasonably doable if you split it up. Uh, but beyond that, it's yeah, it's increasing the risk. Yeah, no, I mean that that's something that we uh, we actually offer on you know better through biology as well is is atp so you know we use it quite a bit um it, it's phenomenal i've noticed like even as small as like five to ten megs can be pretty useful in, in the right setting mm -hmm. um I, I don't know that i've ever done more than like about 15 or 20 but it, it like the combination of a little bit of atp and um maybe just like a little bit of like i i, I kind of prefer small doses of caffeine and maybe a little diamine um and mm -hmm. you can you can really get a pretty awesome gym session in and yeah. uh, you know i kind of prefer the diamine too because you can control your heart rate a little bit better post session it's just not you know it doesn't right. quite last as long and then you know you're not trying to deal with trying to get your heart rate down just to be able to eat your next meal you know <laughs> right 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 i've never used diamine so so how, how like you use it solely as a pre-workout can you explain it a little bit yeah it's it's pretty similar to caffeine in the sense that it it does a lot with adenosine um, mm -hmm. just, you know, kind of blocking adenosine from, uh, I really like to think of like adenosine as I, I was actually just talking to Mike about this just a couple of days mm -hmm. ago. Um, but I like to think about it as like, you know, you wake up and you kind of have this like empty, uh, what I like to imagine is like a movie theater room and you just have all these seats, right. And the door opens and adenosine just kind of slowly walks its way in and starts taking seats. And when you fill uh -huh. up, you know, it's like, okay, it's time for it's time bed, to go to bed. Know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, and while you sleep, you have, you know, you get the removal of adenosine and you have like the lymphatic system and all that stuff too. But it's a big part of what happens while you sleep is removing the adenosine. And so caffeine, what I like to think of is the way caffeine works is it kind of just like breaks through the side door of this movie theater and like just still some of the seats because adenosine is still coming in. Right. But it's like yeah. you, your brain's just not recognizing how much adenosine it's is there. It's standing. Adenosine is standing on the corner to watch the movie. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then all of a sudden, it's like caffeine's like, okay, I'm out, I'm tired. And they all sit down at once, and it's kind of like a caffeine crash. Uh, yeah. dim so, diamine does work a, a little bit similarly that way, but doesn't, it doesn't last as long. Um, and it's a little, a little bit uh, 
does a little bit less, I would guess, as far as like um, uh, having the epinephrine like heart rate. It, it's a little bit more specific than this kind of generalized scope mm-hmm. of what you know caffeine is. So a little, and you know, so it makes it a little easier to control your heart rate on the on the backside. Because I've had times where you know you get you know take like two hundred megs of caffeine and whatever and maybe a little atp to go hit a session and you're like cool i'm done and you look down and it's like heart rate sitting at like 90 still and i'm sitting there and I'm yeah like, it takes a while to get down yeah, yeah it takes a while to get down yeah yeah a little more manageable with diamine but um but yeah i found atp to be you know especially helpful for a spe- you know I, i'm the guy that has a really hard time growing my upper body like legs grow really well as a track guy mm-hmm. you know and, and it was always kind of explosive but using a little bit of atp and maybe like a low dose growth hormone and some, you know, alpha GPC or like an injectable choline. Oh, right. Um, yeah. It's pretty awesome. And you use uh, the injectable choline for um, fatty acid transport or for central nervous system support or both? CNS support. Yeah. yeah. So we, one of our, our my favorite products is, uh, is actually a, uh, uh, it's called Nectar and it has carnitine mm-hmm. and choline in it. And so we can use mm-hmm. the carnitine, you know, mostly for that, that fatty acid, just kind of biasing beta oxidation um kind of like what i like to think of like closing a glycolytic like window um Mm -hmm. and making just a little bit smaller and you have the choline um which we use a a acetylcholine just you know readily comes available in acetylcholine and we have the extra you know a little harder contraction you pair that with like a low dose like growth hormone or maybe like a little bit of uh you know atp or and you know if you Mm -hmm. really want to get spicy like a low dose like t-ball or something you know and just come in and and, why not? and smash it pretty hard <laughs> yeah exactly just why not you know, if you're already <laughs> stacking why, why the fuck not you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's funny yeah did you ever look into the methionine and acetylcholine administrations which which could help with you know fat mobilization and, and fat loss potentially it's actually something um i'm working on right now and i uh, okay. uh a supplement company we're, we're we're starting up so there's a lot of cool things i think if you actually pair that with like um uh maybe like a uh, uh, man, I'm losing the, there's a special creatine that came out. It's not creapure. It's called, uh, um, ah, oh, crap. I can't remember what it's so, called. Right so now. many variants now. All I know, all I remember is creatine monohydrate, the most studied and the most efficacious, but I, I guess there's a new right. version. Is it, so yeah. the study is not, not sponsored by the developer, right? With the, with all the other creatine <laughs> studies. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I know there's always something, but yeah, basically that's like pairing it with like a creatine, maybe a couple of methyl donors in the right sense. And you can have a pretty cool product, okay. I think. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Keep me posted. Keep me posted. I was looking on the forefront for new stuff. It sounds, sounds very We actually have a, uh, one product coming out where we're actually taking a, uh, a, cre- a phosphocreatine, like a, f- a pure creatine phosphate, you know, creatine that's already been phosphorylated because, you know, mm-hmm. as you know, like you take creatine monohydrate, you strip off the monohydrate little, you know, water, and then you get creatine in your blood and now it has to be phosphorylated to make right. creatine phosphate, right? And so basically when you're at rest, uh, you're basically going to have an ATP that's like, cool, here's my phosphate bond, I'll let you have it until I yeah. need it back, right? And then it right. goes through, Story. you know, oxidative yeah. ways, builds back up ATP, and now you have this like quick acting. Um, so we're actually coming out with this injectable creatine uh, phosphate. It's got a little carnitine, oh. a little choline, um, a little acetylcholine. We're actually going to put a little calcium um, uh-huh. uh, in there as well, and it's just going to be a uh, it's going to be a pretty cool just like that sounds strength. pretty interesting. Would that technically yeah. then also lower CPK levels, right? Creatine phosphokinase, the enzyme that's required in there, because that's generally very high in, in athletes, obviously, because they use a lot of, you know, creatine uh, production. And those enzymes can tend to leak into, uh, you know, the, the bloodstream after strenuous workouts. So you see CPK levels of like 2,000, 5,000. Yeah, or close to rapto. Um, so would a product like that potentially be able to lower serum CPK levels? You know, that's the idea of it. Uh, as far as like, can I guarantee it works? I mean, <laughs> we don't yeah. know yet, right? Yeah. Uh, but it'll be fun to kind of put that in testing and see what happens there and actually see if we're, we're, we can drop down those levels. Because, you know, obviously we do need a little bit of, uh, it naturally, we do need a little bit of creatine kinase to be able to store, uh, course, and, yeah. you know, creatine phosphates. But, you know, the injectable will, will be really exciting. And who, you know, I think it's kind of a fun product too, because we've probably all talked about the joke about like, oh, I, I'm injecting creatine. <laughs> yeah, it's like cool. Now <laughs> I'm actually injecting creatine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, now the natties will slowly start to uh, go to injectable creatine as a gateway drug. 
to, uh, exactly. to actual performance enhancing drugs, which is so funny. Like the the natty community is weird because they're willing to take injectable carnitine, um, mm-hmm. of course, which is a synthesized version of something you uh, produce biologically, but because it's not on the water prohibited list, they consider themselves natural, but synthetic testosterone, um, or maybe because not. you downregulate the HPTA, yeah, then you're not natural anymore. It's, natties are funny, man. Funny, you know, we, I, we all do that. I to leverage extent, all options. Though, right? <laughs> yeah, we all like justify things in a weird way. We're like, yeah. oh, this is okay because I did it this way. But the whole natty debate is really funny. It's like, wh- wh- where's the line? Like, it, it's bodybuilding so is very unnatural. I mean, otherwise everybody would be jacked, right? I mean, when you look at gorillas, they're fucking jacked for no reason and they eat grass. Basically, they're foraging a little bit. Um, you know, but, but humans actually, are not. <laughs> What you just said right there with gorillas naturally being jacked just because they eat grass. Like, now someone's gonna out there, it's gonna be like the, the next gorilla guy who's like, we should all be eating grass. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, walking yeah, on all but, fours. You know, bodybuilders, they would, eat, they would eat cardboard if it makes them muscular, you know? But it's yeah, it's funny to see, like, like, humans naturally, like most people, are naturally pretty slender, right? So if you want to gain some muscle, um, you, you really have to damage the muscle in a hypertrophy response to make it bigger. Um, naturally, we're not this jacked. Like, there's always these token outliers out there, you know, especially some African-American, uh, you know, places where, where guys are just more muscular than average, right? And even in America, they have a reference range, particularly for African-Americans, because the creatinine levels are generally higher because they have more muscle mass. But when you look at humanity as a whole, humans are not that muscular. So bodybuilding is basically the most unnatural act you can do as body modification. Um, and whether you're natural or not, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like all, all unnatural in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. If you think about it too, it's like, you're actually becoming less functional of a human, right? Like yeah. it, it, it looks awesome. Don't get me wrong. I think bodybuilding yeah. sick. Like I would yeah. love to, you know, just be as big as possible, but it's like, you think it from like a survival standpoint, it's like, cool. I can't move as fast. I can't move very long. I need 5,000 calories a day to just survive. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I suck we, we would, I think in, in the zombie apocalypse, if we don't get attacked by zombies, we would last the longest because we have so much stored protein and that, <laughs> you know, and then, it, you know, if, if we have to diet on Twinkies, you know, that's the only food that's available 10 years after the zombie apocalypse. I think all the protein will sustain us the longest compared to everybody else, <laughs> but we probably get eaten the first because we're so immobile and we can't run unless we have data. I don't, unless we can source all the data, we can just run away from all the zombies. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's that's fast. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's pretty funny. It's going to end up being uh, who who stores the most nitrogen. That's going to be yeah, the, yeah. the new gold. Nitrogen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we, we'll be known as the nitrogen bags. We'll be used as cattle <laughs> from all the... <laughs> that's, <freaking. laughs> that's funny. That's so funny. Hey, you wanted to talk specifically about growth hormone when we set up this uh, this podcast. Uh, you have some new insights about growth hormone and practical applications and how we can use this the best. Oh man, yeah. I mean, I, I, I in my opinion, growth hormone is probably my favorite uh, my favorite PED. I think it's the most versatile. Okay. There's so many things you can do with it. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, like kind of not to get too off topic with what we just talked about, but you know, when you talk about like hypertrophy and, and bodybuilding, kind of being the sport of you know, really just like growing, growing muscle tissue and whatnot. Mm-hmm. One of the factors that will decide if you actually can grow, you know, grow or not, especially if you're natural, like, um, is like the, the, the state of your immune system, right? It's like, mm-hmm. if you want to actually destroy, you know, damage part of your, your muscle cell and then build it back to a supra, you know, of, of what it was, you have to have an immune system that's like, that's like firing well and, and understands that things are plentiful enough or, you know, to, uh, to actually grow and, and, and make that adaptation because it won't happen. Um, this is like, you know, whenever you see a guy that's like constantly sick and, you know, he's jacked, you're like, okay, <laughs> you're obviously on something because that's not yeah. happening naturally, right? But, you know, and, and my point with that, though, is that if you can take care of yourself uh, from it, like, if you can really manage yourself as far as this you know total allostatic load that's on you from whether it's work training stress whatever and you can really manage your immune system most I, you can make some incredible progress just with like insulin and growth hormone um mm-hmm. and, and like growth hormone is probably the one drug that i've used in every in every setting um not that i'm offering like new insight here like 
I think a lot of people understand like what growth hormone, you know, is. I think it's also probably the most improperly named one. I think it should be yeah. more, you know, like immune hormone or something because because the state of your immune system is absolutely going to be based on what growth hormone does, right? Like for example, like if you go like study for a long time and Mm -hmm. uh, you really strain your brain, you create all these like BDNFs and whatever, or like you go practice your skill, like a skill, uh, a sport-based skill or whatever. You have a lot of NGFs and whatever, just all these neuro growth factors. And then you use a little bit of growth hormone. It's really going to react based on those, like those growth factors uh, and, and what I would call kind of these, like these, these scavengers of the immune system. And then those are, that's going to really drive what's going to make the adaptation. Right. So, uh, and, and like, you know, so I don't really like to break down the immune system into kind of like scavengers and responders. So you kind of have these like scavengers, which are like uh, a lot of growth factors, you know, kind of like the cytokines of the world. These are like, uh, you, you, I could you put heat shock proteins in here too, but what it is like, I just did this thing. Like if you went out and trained really hard and did like a glycolytic session or whatever, you developed all this lactate, they're going to just secrete whatever it was that you did. You will secrete ex, uh, extremely specific growth factors right. and proteins that, that uh, are now going to be out in your body. And then once that's done or, you know, is finishing your body kind of goes through and assesses and says like, okay, we have like, you know, this many of this growth factors. We have this many heat shock proteins. We have this many of this. What does this mean? Okay, now we have food available. Now we have nitrogen available. Now we have growth hormone available. Cool, this is how we're going to adapt. And it's going to drive that cascade, right? So if you can really like, you know, understand these like underlying principles of biology and uh, learn how to, how to feed yourself properly and learn what, you know, your nutrition is saying, the way that you're covering this, you know, what these signals are telling your body, you can make most of your progress. You can make tons of progress off of just insulin and growth hormone. And then you modulate those signals, those like signaling, like proteins through things like, you know, like glutathione and, and like carnitine and, and stuff like that. So you can get these hyper specific uh, signaling proteins uh, to you. You can make so much growth just off of that. And, I, you know, so I always get really frustrated when I see like, you see like a brand new girl that's like, oh, I'm going to do a bikini or wellness or whatever. And they're doing their first show. And their coach immediately is like, oh, Anivar every day. And like, Anivar and Kled and T3, let's go. <laughs> you're like, what? Like, like if you're going to add in anything, it's like, well, first off, like probably just eat normal and just train hard for a little bit, right? And like build up something. Um, yeah. But in my opinion, I think the first things that you should utilize are not AAS at all. It's like, I, like, Growth hormone is an awesome one. Insulin's an awesome one. Like they're both analogs that can be both pulled back and forth too. Like you do too much growth hormone, there's ways to modulate that. You do too much insulin, you can eat food. You know, like mm-hmm. and, and same. And it's like, oh man, I'm I'm getting too hypoxic or whatever. You can use things like you know, like injectable uh, uh, carnitine, and then now you have a little bit of a different response with growth hormone. Now it becomes a little bit more specific. But I think if everyone kind of you know took a step back and really understood that human biology really well, I think they'd realize like, you know, probably don't need to use AAS nearly as much. I think, I think you're only going to understand biology in this depth is if you coach athletes that are subject to drug testing because you're handicapped with a a laundry list of stuff you can't use. So you have to leverage all these little biological processes. Like what you all mentioned just now is, not on the on the wider list and i completely understand where you're coming from because you know with some of your athletes obviously you can't use particular compounds that are you know romanticized like everybody wants to go and test and train and anivore and clean and all that stuff right because it's easy and you get results even if you do everything wrong but if you can't use those yeah right it's true so but if you can't if you can't use those compounds because your athletes or yourself are subject to drug testing then you are forced to understand human biology a little bit better and then leverage all these little things like mitochondrial function, ATP synthesis, lactate inhibition, right? All these little things. So, but there's not so many guys who, you know, go into this route of coaching these kinds of athletes. So you get, you get it, I get it. Um, and hopefully my audience will get it. Right? You guys have been paying attention. Um, but if you incorporate these kinds of things in a, in a low dose cycle, and I always told my, my audience, like, listen, you don't need to use so much steroids or these other compounds if you leverage the biology, right, by using growth hormone, insulin, and some other pathways, um, then you can literally cut your steroid dosages in half, which people oh, always absolutely. frown about. Now I need two grams of gear. No, you can get it done maybe with 
750 or a gram, but you need to look into these other pathways also, right? And, and, and incorporate the synergy. Because like you mentioned, I mean, there's autocrine um, hormone signaling post-workout, right? And and improving your sleep quality and all these little things you can optimize. Of course, it, it you have to treat it like a full-time job, right? I mean, if you're a recreational lifter, you have like three meals, two shakes, two injections, and then you hope you get some results. But like for a real athlete or even for myself, I mean, you have multiple meals, everything is structured, right? You do particular things at certain times to facilitate very small biological processes. But when you add it all together at the end of the month or the end of the year, I mean, it's it's stellar progress, stellar changes oh, yeah. that you can initiate, you know? But yeah, there's a huge learning curve, but that's why we have guys like you. Like I'm retired from coaching, so I, don't, I, I put everything out there for free on the internet. But, you know, a guy like you that, that understands it, I mean, you're probably still taking clients, right? Yeah, um, I, you know, I do quite a bit of, of coaching still, and that's, you know, probably the, the, the number one thing I, I do. But, yeah, I mean, like, you know, I don't do a ton of bodybuilding, but, I, you know, to this point, I, I haven't had a girl uh, body doing, you know, into prep that's done more than 5 to 10 milligrams a week total Thank you. of androgens. And, oh, you know, it's just by per week. I thought you were going to say I, per day. <laughs> No, I, All like right. per week. Yeah, it, it, we're we're trying to. I think the most we've ever done is thirteen milligrams a week for you know for a bodybuilding prep, and it's so low. And it's like if you can oh, learn insane, how man. to to take advantage of these things and, and just time it out right, like there's so much you can do, right? Especially with females because they have a really cool estradiol, you know, like interactions with growth hormone and everything too. Yeah. Um, it, it, but I think in the same way that people use steroids, they're kind of doing that with like what we talked about earlier with like clan beater on T3. It's like, Hey, I can't miss with these. Right. It's like, if I, if I play clan, like I'm going to get this result. Like it's a fat loss. Oh, I hate it when people call it a fat loss drug or start like <laughs> categorizing drugs like that. Yeah. Um, or this is like a, this is a bulking drug or a bulker uh, and gosh. a cutter. Yeah. I just made two great uh, videos about that. <laughs> To bait them in. Like, cool. This is the best bulking star. This is the best cutting star. And I, of course, I explained it to them in depth <laughs> what you know contest prep or cutting phases and off season phases actually entail. Uh, but that's how you got to bait them in, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it's pretty, it's pretty frustrating. But yeah, it's if you really understand these things and you know, um, and you can lay things out because there are times where you know, um, even while you're growing, it's like, Hey, maybe I actually need a temporary period of time to actually kind of be in a fasted state, you know, even that's only for a couple hours or for like a, a single day or something where I'm not saying like mm -hmm. you should fast all day or whatever, but it's like, you do need to kind of worry about like insulin sensitivity. You do have to have these AMPK pathways. You do have to worry about these things. And if you really kind of learn how to time it right, it's like, wow, I can grow and lose fat at the same time and kind of use these epigenetic cascades to facilitate it because yeah. you know and then you just use anabolics as like that epigenetic drug to facilitate these changes that you want out of these people which is pretty fascinating yeah did you ever do like multiple day fasting with your athletes um not too much no i'm, I'm not a big big believer in like you know uh, there's a lot you know you could with the whole like autophagy like <laughs> clan mm -hmm. over there that's like oh you need to fast and like and it's like there are times like i don't know if you've listened a lot to like dr sinclair from harvard and whatever and he's like yeah fast all, all the time and, and and whatever and there are times where it's like yeah absolutely oh, those, like yeah they mostly do it for anti-aging because they're scared you know and then yeah and but of course it, they don't want to die in the, <laughs> i know and then you, you hear bodybuilders talk about that we're like oh anti-aging they start worrying about it. it's like but you do want your muscle tissue to be as old as possible. Like if you could have like 500 year old muscle tissue, that's golden, right? Like you want it to be mature and hard and developed. And we just mm -hmm. don't really want to age our brains and, you know, exactly. and certain things yeah. too far, but it's not that you should be scared of aging. It's like, it's, it's kind of like everything's just specific, right? Yeah. I like, I like fasting. I mean, you know, I'm doing it right now. I'm on day five of fasting. Um, so oh, that's, that's awesome. why I asked, yeah, <laughs> and I'm so pretty cognitive. I mean, it could be better, but I'm, I'm think I'm doing pretty okay. So the reason why I fast is mostly for intestinal health and to kind of reset because it improves <laughs> insulin sensitivity. It, it removes Absolutely. all these inflammatory cytokines and, you know, autophagy aside, I mean, it, it's, it's always a little bit to be debated because, you know, you still take some over the counter supplements to help with micronutrient balance because otherwise you create such a deficit of micronutrients. Um, and it's just. I feel like it improves like your overall state of your being. Of course, you take a couple steps back regarding animalism, but I've always done it every three months or so to take a week off from eating five, five and a half days. So tomorrow morning I'll eat again. I stopped last Sunday and I, 
for from the athletes that are willing to do it, they notice such a tremendous um, growth spurt afterwards that even though you might take a step back for a week and then the two weeks getting back into the gym because you created such a deficit, the net result over three months is so much more significant because now you're responsive to all the hormones and the nutrients and all the other stuff you abstain from for an entire week um, going yeah. forward. So this is this is why I like it. And one day fast is, is also great, but really a hard fast of five days. Like all these little injuries that you have by taking a week off and just going through the autophagy process resolve themselves. Again, no need to throw the kitchen sink with TB500 to BBC157 at it. All the nagging problems you have in the intestinal tract by removing all the repetitive foods really fixes that as well. And then you use a little bit of, you know, fiber supplements or some vegetables. Like I usually have like two big salads per day to kind of pass everything through, right? Because you still need to bind up all those um, bile acids that are coming from the liver as you're heavily detoxifying. So at least you pass that through. Otherwise, you have too much enterohepatic recirculation. Um, so you need some fiber or vegetables to get that done. So I do feel it's beneficial. Um, I, I would look into it, but it's scary as an athlete to say I'm not yeah. going to eat for a week because, I, dude, I lost like six kilos on the scale, so that's 12, 13 pounds. Right? So I went from like 210 pounds to sub 200, and sub 200 pounds is not a man. Uh, when you step <laughs> on the scale, you're like, fuck, I'm, I'm below 200 pounds. This is not good. You know, I'm five. Now. I mean, I used to be 260 <laughs> a long time ago, you know, when I was at my prime. Uh, but yeah, when you see that scale drop to the 198, you're like, oh, man, that this ain't good but it all goes back <laughs> no it's a, just a mental roadblock it's <laughs> you know so it's but yeah, I, I do and, think and it's, it's highly like, beneficial yeah yeah and it's not like you're 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 losing a ton of, of like real weight either too right no, it's, i mean it's, it makes it's a lot of sense there. i mean it's lean it's, dense, it's still there it's, yeah it's still there it's just not as big as it used to be and of course if i start reintroducing uh, carbohydrates and a little bit of nutrients i gained that 10 pounds back and I net lost, you know, a couple of pounds of fat in the in the process. But again, all the all the metabolic processes are are now resensitized, and then you can make actually pretty good progress. Yeah, yeah. Again, no, it makes a lot of sense. I haven't haven't had anyone do something as extensive as a five five day fast, but you know, I, I have done people do one or two days before yeah. here and there, um, and and kind of consistently, um, where you know it's like every two weeks or something, yeah. Um, yeah. and, and it, it it does you know, do a lot. Um, in fact, like a lot of times, like powerlifters, they complain about doing their, their, their water cuts into a meat and they eat a little bit less that week, but then they feel fantastic on meat day. It's like, you know, that actually that little water cut and, and having a little less food. And, and sometimes they even take out their carbohydrates for a few days or whatever. And, 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 you know, they fill up and they're huge and they're like even bigger than they were before because, you know, you yeah. utilize a little insulin and growth and whatever. Um, and, and it's pretty fascinating. Um, but no, it makes a lot of sense. Probably feel a lot better, like a lot of less, like little inflammations and whatnot too. I, I feel great. a lot lighter. I feel mobile and athletic, which is a, a, a weird word to use as a bodybuilder. <laughs> yeah, that, that seems wrong. I don't think it's supposed to be yeah, like that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's messing with my brain. So so no, I'll probably be back about 210 pounds. But it's yeah, it's something I always can recommend, especially for high-level athletes, because you put your body under so much stress, whether that's food, oxidative stress, training intensity, nagging injuries, and you just take, you say you clock out for a week, right? You don't go to the gym, you don't eat, you don't administer anything. You just take some, you know, basic health supplements to kind of make sure your electrolyte balance is sustained so you don't, you know, get into this weird roller coaster of water retention afterwards. And uh, it does a lot of people a lot of good, but it's, it's probably the scariest roadblock that people need to, need to get over um, because mm. a week of food, right? I mean, I'm going to go so catabolic. <sighs> Scary. I know it's so bad, right? <laughs> yeah, it's so bad. Yeah, but it's once you go through it the first time, like I did it like seven years ago the first time, and after you go through the first time, you're like, you know what? No, it's actually not too bad, and it doesn't yeah. cost anything. If anything, you save money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right. All right. Anything else you want to uh, discuss during this podcast? Like anything new no, that we... that's coming on, and and you know something you're super excited about. Um, you know, there are a couple of things that are a little bit down the pipeline that are kind of coming up, but, uh, you know, for the most part, um, I think we covered quite a bit in this. It was, uh, fun to get on and talk about a whole bunch of different things. 
Yeah, this was great, man. I've, I'm so happy to meet people who understand all these little intricacies and, you know, talk about amoxipine and data and all these little niche compounds and then understand how the biology works. Because, again, there's not so many guys of us out there. And I really try to collect and talk to all the knowledgeable guys that we can find in the fitness space. So thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for coming on, man. This was a lot of fun. I hope to get you on in the future again, maybe in a couple of months when you, uh, you know, have some uh, more uh, product development on the back end. That's always fun to talk about. Where where can people find you? Um, so uh, first off, yeah, thanks for allowing me to come onto your uh, onto your page too. It's uh, you know it's been good meeting to, meeting you and talking to you and everything. Um, as far as where people can find me, I'm not too active on on social media. I, I just kind of started up a, a Better Through Biology Instagram page. It's a uh, Better Dot Through Dot Biology. Um, mm -hmm. and you can follow the page. I've started to put up some content there talking about how you know different ways that you can utilize things like you know, uh, non-androgenic things like, you know, the carnitines, mm -hmm. the cholines, the ATPs, the data, stuff like that. Um, and, and really getting on there and, and kind of talking about these things. I, I, we've made some posts on like, you know, CBD and how that works and, and right. whatnot. So just kind of like alternatives to, uh, to PEDs and, and whatnot. So that's mostly where you'll, you'll find most of my content. We, I mean, I'm just about to release a blog here too, um, with, uh, okay. Ben Pollock, if you know who that is. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. He's a really good friend of mine. He's one of cool. one of the guy I've been working with for like the last year or so, and it's going to be called the uh, Peducator. <laughs> ah, <laughs> <kind of> <laughs> okay, yeah. Can you can you attach a YouTube channel to that? Because again, a lot of people I, I noticed this myself. I have a website with blog articles, like you know, in WordPress website. Nobody reads, mm -hmm. right? I can compare my site oh, yeah. analytics to my YouTube <laughs> analytics. And nobody reads anymore. Like I got maybe fifteen hundred pages of written articles that I never even published. Uh, I had to use have a private Facebook group where I would just educate people there, and I never published them because I knew it would not get any traction. So I just turned it all into videos, and now we're at a hundred thousand subscribers. So I I would recommend you, with this knowledge that you have, instead of writing the articles or maybe writing the articles first, turn it into videos. It will do your business a world of good. I promise you. Yeah. No, that sounds good. Maybe you know maybe we'll do that. We also have don't, like don't little, say maybe. Uh, just do it. Trust me. Do it. And then <laughs> okay. One year later, you will remember this conversation. Like, yeah, Steve was right. YouTube is the okay. Future. You got it. <laughs> yeah. No, that sounds good. We'll we'll definitely do that. Um, we do have a uh, if Joe Sullivan and I are, are also kind of doing a a podcast with um uh, under uh, Mark Bell where he's uh okay. on it performance education conversation. It is video. It's a video based podcast. Um, okay. And those are going to start releasing here, I think, in like the next week or two. I think they're oh, cool. going to be releasing well, it on his page. Give me a call. I'll be happy to be a guest. No, that would be awesome. We would love to have yeah. you on there. That would be that'd be incredible. For sure, man. For sure. That's awesome. Okay, looking forward to that. And I'm happy that Mark Bell is back online because we almost had a heart attack for like two weeks. One oh, was man, offline. I know. Yeah, uh, we're all uh, very happy that it's back. And Think Big Bodybuilding also got deleted, but they're also back. So we lost uh, two of the, the best YouTube channels out there. We got them back in a in two-week notice. So, But we got to be careful on what we say. <laughs> for I know, jeez. <laughs> I'll, link, I'll link all your social media details down below and where people can find you. And I hope they help you on again. And otherwise, I'll see you on your podcast reasonably soon, man. This was great. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Absolutely. Thank you. You too. Take care, buddy. Ciao.